Bible is the NRSV. This is uh, NRSV, stands for New Revised Standard Version. There's nothing wrong with the, uh, the NIV. It's a great version, it's, it's a personal preference that I have. But what I noticed was that there's a difference, there's a fundamental difference in the two translations. So, let's see if you can figure out what the difference is. So, in the, the version that you've just heard from the NIV, the New International Version, it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Okay. Then Simon Peter replies, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Okay, now let's read the NRSV and see if we can pick up the difference. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say I am? Is there a difference there that you can pick up? What's the difference? So, so based, it's not, it's, not, it's not very clear in the NIV, but in the NRSV, Jesus asks two different questions. What are the two questions that he asks? The first question is, Who do you say the Son of Man? You say. And the second question is, Who do you say I am? Aha! So is the question, or is the answer, is an answer given as to who the Son of Man is? Is a definitive answer given? No. no. It remains unanswered. So the first question is, who do you say the Son of Man is? He asks his disciples. Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. That's Son of Man, and that's the speculation that the disciples offer. Then Jesus says, and who do you say I am? Okay. So there's, there's, there's actually, in, in general, nowadays, 2,000 years later, and pretty soon actually after the resurrection, in terms of the context of the early church, we assigned that title, Son of Man, to Jesus. But within, there's, a, there's been a lot of, of, of stuff that has been written on this subject of the Son of Man and who the Son of Man is. And there were many different beliefs floating around at the time. So, for example, um, Elijah was, was supposed to, to be a forerunner of the Messiah. He was supposed to, to return. Elijah was supposed to return. Why was Elijah supposed to return? Any ideas? Why specifically Elijah? He didn't die. Remember, he, got, he was translated into heaven. By the whirlwind. He was taken up into heaven. So, so Jewish people still at the Passover supper, they keep a seat for? Because they believe he's still going to come back before the Messiah comes, right? Um, and there was, so there's a whole lot of different beliefs that were floating around in the first century. And there were also beliefs around this figure called the Son of Man. But one of the ways in which this phrase was used, Son of Man, um, it appears in, 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 in the book of Daniel, and that's where we get this ap ap apocalyptic imagery of the Son of Man. But, but are you familiar with the book of Ezekiel? God refers or addresses Ezekiel as Son of Man. Throughout the book of Ezekiel, he says, Son of, in Ezekiel 37, when he asks Ezekiel if the bones in the dry valley can live, he says, Son of Man, prophesy to these bones. He says, can these bones live? Prophesy to these bones. Right? So, so there's a way, there, it was actually quite common, this phrase, son of man, in first century Hebrew and in first century Aramaic to be used. And it, was, and it just meant, one of the ways, one of the common ways it was used was just to, to mean your average Joe, like the average person on the street, right? 
So now I want to take a little bit of license in looking at our gospel reading and I wish to try and just change the question slightly. So we can't actually, I don't know if it's going to be helpful if we look at, if we try and figure out, if we try and arrive at an answer as to who this Son of Man is in the eschatological or apocalyptic sense, right? Instead, I want us, I want us to imagine that Jesus is asking a more general question, okay? It's a little bit of a leap that we have to take, but a more general question, and I want us to imagine that Jesus is posing the question in a general sense, but, he's, but, but also in a specific sense where he's posing the question to you. And he's saying to you, who do people say you are? Okay? So this is the question that I, that, that I wish for us to focus on briefly. It's, 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 not, it's not the question that Jesus is asking admittedly in the, in the Gospel passage, but I'm taking a little bit of license and I'm changing the focus, and you're going to see where I'm going with this, hopefully. But I want us to imagine that when Jesus poses the question, who is the Son of Man, I want, him, I want us to imagine that he's asking, who is Janet? Who is Tam? Who is Matthew? Who is Heather? Okay? Now I want you to imagine that Jesus is posing this question to you, and when he poses this question to you, and you think about an answer, I want you to pause and take a little bit of time as you contemplate this question, right? It's a fundamentally important question in some ways. Now, as you contemplate this question, think about your various circles of influence, right? So who do your friends say you are? Remember, it's no longer who, who do people say the Son of Man is. We're focusing it on ourselves now. Who do your friends say you are? What do your friends say about you? Who do your work colleagues say you are? What do your work colleagues say about you? Who do your school peers, your school colleagues, say that you are? If I have to go to them now, and I say, Frank's no longer at school. I don't even know if he's still working, Frank. <laughs> but, but to maybe, maybe Sharon, uh, Sharon or Fence, if you're still working, and I go to your colleagues, and I say, who is offensive to you? And then I go to his friends and I say, so who is offensive to you? And then I come to church and I say, who is offensive to you? We'll get different answers and we'll get different answers if we do that for each of us, isn't it? If you go to my friends, you will get a, a certain answer. If you go to my family, you will get a certain answer. If you go to my fellow clergy, you will get a different answer. right? And will all of those answers... Will all of those answers be satisfactory to you? Will you be satisfied with those answers? Will they live up to your own personal expectations about who you are? Not necessarily, right? So this is, and so this is the first question that Jesus poses. And notice that the same question might have been posed hypothetically to the disciples, right? So we, we, we're doing a, two, a twofold thing. We're imagining a scenario where Jesus is amongst us and he's posing this question to us, who do people say that you are? Okay? But now he's posed the same question to the disciples. Forget about the Son of Man for a second. He's posing this question to the disciples and he says to Peter, Peter, who do people say that you are, really? Now, in hindsight, 2,000 years later, well, Peter denied Christ three times at Christ's most critical hour of need. Before the cock crowed three times, Peter was like, I'm out of here, guys. Cheers. Bye. Bye, Jesus. See you at the end of the age, at Judgment Day. I've had enough of this. I'm deserting you now at your greatest hour of need, but I, I, can't, do any, any, I can't do otherwise. That's just me, right? 
Or he goes to Thomas and he says, Thomas, who do people say that you are? Well, Thomas didn't believe that Jesus rose again from the grave. When his, when his colleagues and his disciples told him that Jesus had been risen, he said, no, 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 no. I, I'm, not, I'm not prepared to believe that. And unless I see the marks in his hands and the mark in his side, I'm not going to believe. So Thomas doesn't have faith, right? Then he goes to James and John and he says to James and John, who do people say that you are? And James and John were like, well, you know, there was this one time on the, on the, on the, when we were on the way to Jerusalem and all we could think about was our, our own desires and our own personal ambitions and all we were concerned about is the glory and the power and the authority you were going to assign to us when you came into your kingdom. That's why we asked you, when you come into your kingdom, Lord, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left. Just selfish, introspective, focused on their own goals, right? Now, let's just ask this base, very basic question. Do other people's perceptions and belief, beliefs, and maybe let's admit this as well, that other people's perceptions and beliefs may have a basis. Let's even say other people's negative perceptions and beliefs about you, if they do have such perceptions about you, may have a basis. You might have done something in the past in a certain context among a certain group of people where they were like, hmm, Janine, I don't think she's such a good person and she calls herself a Christian. This Matthew chap, I mean, he's got, he wears a collar, but he, he calls himself a Christian. He calls himself a disciple of Christ. Right? So we all, we all experience such circumstances and such situations from time to time, hopefully not too often. But I'm willing to bet that something along those lines has happened to us at some point. Now we ask the question, if you are going to base your identity on what other people say, on, on who other people say you are, how far are you really going to get, brothers and sisters? Okay, so now, now we come, and, and here's the other thing, before we ask the second question, Here's the other thing, is there will be times in your life when you don't even know who you are. There have been times in my life where I was like, I thought I was this kind of person, but I was put into a situation where my character was tested, my resolve was tested, and now I've emerged with a picture or with a perception of myself with, which, is, with, which is in conflict with with who I thought I was, initially. So there will be times in your life when your own identity for yourself is questioned by virtue of the challenges and the circumstances that you encounter. So now we ask the question, if you don't know who you are, if you yourself, who is the most qualified person to say who you are? So, I'm going to answer that question now. But if you don't know who you are, how on earth can you expect other people to know who you are? That's, that's ludicrous, that's ridiculous, right? So here's the, 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 the fundamental and ultimate question. Who do you say Christ is? Who do you say Christ is? Because if you know who Christ is, that's all that matters. Brothers and sisters, that is, that is what is of fundamental importance. If you know who Christ is, and notice when, when Jesus poses this question to Peter, forget about what other people say about you, Peter. I know that you're going to deny me at my most crucial hour. I, and don't just forget for a second about who you are. Forget what other people say about who you are. I don't care about any of that. What I'm concerned about is who you believe I am. That is the most important thing. Because if you know that I, if you know who I am, everything else will flow from that. Right? So when Jesus poses the question to Peter, and Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, what is Jesus' response? Blessed are you. Blessed are you. And this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. This was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. This was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. 
And I tell you, you are Peter. I confer your identity on you, no one else. Only Jesus Christ has the authority and the power to place and confer your identity on you. Nobody else has that authority. So just get that into our heads. No one else can confer your identity upon you other than Jesus Christ. And this is exactly what transpires in this encounter that, that Peter has with Jesus. When Peter has this revelation given to him by God, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, right? And he knows, it's essentially, he worships Jesus as, as the Christ, as the Messiah, as the Son of the living God. At that point, Jesus blesses Peter, Blesses Peter, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, and he gives him a new name. His name previously had been Cephas, Cephas, now it's Peter. And what does Peter mean in Greek? Rock. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, right? And everything flows from this, brothers and sisters. Everything flows from this. So the, the, the next time you, and, and we live in an age now, thank the Lord that I'm not on social media. I've never been, I've never had a, a Facebook account, if you can believe that, never. Because we live in an age now where our identity is constituted by social media. When you go home, you're going to check your Instagram, you're going to check your Facebook, you're going to check Twitter and see how many likes your comments have got, how many likes your posts have got, isn't it? Aren't you going to do that? Maybe even, maybe even the first thing you do as you walk out of church. And all of those likes, right, are going to feed your ego and feed this falsely constituted personality, which is baseless. It's baseless. It has no... It has no fundamental basis whatsoever. So if you take that away, if you take that away, if you take all the likes away, all the social media away, where is Eden? Right? I don't know if you use social media, Sue. I'm guessing perhaps not. But for the younger people, what is your identity based on? Your identity is conferred upon you by no one else than Jesus Christ. And when your identity, when you receive your identity from Jesus Christ, that identity is irrevocable. It becomes the rock. It becomes the foundation. It becomes the basis upon which Christ builds his church. And against that rock, against that foundation, the gates of hell cannot prevail. They cannot prevail. Then, everything flows from this, brothers and sisters. Everything flows from this. Because then, not only are you blessed, not only are you blessed, not only have you received your true and irrevocable identity by Christ, which no one else can take away, but you receive power. Isn't it? You receive power and you receive authority. What power and what authority was Peter given? That which you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And that which you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Now this power, maybe I'm going a step too far, I don't know, but I'm, 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 I'm hazarding a guess, I'm willing to suggest that in addition to the blessing and the identity, so too you receive this power. That when people say stuff about you, doesn't matter, your work colleagues, right? your friends, family, Whatever, social media, you have the power to loose and unbind. There is nothing. When we, when we acknowledge this, when we have this revelation, when we enter into this relationship with Christ, when we receive our identity, when we receive Christ's blessing, we too receive the power to unbind and to loose. So that anything negative that anyone potentially says about you has no effect on you. Because that which you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. That which you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I wish I had a joke to end the sermon on because it feels like a very serious, <laughs> serious homily, right? But it's, a, but it's a serious topic, friends, isn't it? 
So remember finally in closing, where do we receive our identity from? Jesus. Not social media, not even necessarily your brothers and sisters, or your, your family, or your friends, but from, so when you go home today, when in your quiet time, we tr I'm making the suggestion, don't feel compelled to do it, contemplate, in, ask, speak to Jesus, speak to your Lord, speak to Jesus, the Son of the living God, and say, Lord, I wish for you to reveal to me my true identity, because I know that when you reveal my true identity to me, that identity will be unshakable. It will, be, it will form the basis, it will form the basis of who I am. Everything else will flow from that. But if your identity, remember it's about the, the parable of the man, the foolish man who builds his house on sand, and the one who builds his house on rock, if your foundation is the rock, if your foundation is Christ, remember the rock from which you are hewn, brothers and sisters, not Abraham. As people of faith, as children of God, we were hewn from the rock that is Christ. So if you, if you have your foundation, is there can begin to build. But if your foundation is social media, if your foundation is Twitter, if your foundation is Instagram, if your foundation is people's perceptions about you, your house will fall flat. May you be blessed. Amen. Amen.